everybody. Welcome to the 18th episode of Drive Through FM, releasing on a kind of an odd schedule this month. Uh, if you haven't noticed on the YouTube channel, I've been doing a lot more of the normal reviews and stuff after Gen Con, trying to kind of parse through all of those releases. There's been a lot of uh, really good games that I felt like uh, deserved, uh, so to speak, my time in the video treatment, and I was excited about the games, more importantly. <laughs> And, you know, so I'd been doing videos and stuff like that. So I'm not going to really have much in the way of quote unquote reviews for this particular podcast. Uh, I'll do a couple of things. I'm going to mention a couple of upcoming reviews that you can look forward to uh, probably in a week or so. And then I'll kind of talk about a couple of games that have sort of fallen on the wayside in terms of my estimation of them. One will be maybe slightly controversial, I hope not. And then the other one should not be at all. And then I'm going to jump into and talk about a thread I put up on Twitter, which you won't be able to find because I've been sort of migrating from Twitter to Instagram. So you can find me on Instagram now, as well as the normal drive through review Facebook page if you're looking for uh, interaction on kind of the social media stuff. But I did grab down one of the threads that I kind of started on Twitter a few months ago, got a lot of really nice feedback on it. And it was one of those things that I just had sort of a, a burn to uh, write. And it's the uh, sort of the top 10 things that I've learned from painting miniatures. It's a couple of years ago, I kind of started really getting into it and getting into more of the miniature gaming, but you know, really getting into kind of the painting and stuff like that. And so as somebody that hadn't ever done that in terms of, you know, any way, shape or form, I'd never done that. And I'd always been kind of shied away from it because I like the whole concept of, you know, you get the game in the box, it's everything that you need to play and so on and not really having to do a lot of extra work and all that kind of stuff. And just really was sort of ignorant of the miniature tabletop world and all the kind of things that sort of surprised me and things that I just kind of learned through, you know, kind of going into that process. So let's just kind of jump in. Uh, the two kind of main reviews I just wanted to highlight and just mention that I'm excited about them and I'm 100% going to be doing full video reviews of is the first one is the new Brass editions. There's Brass Lancashire and Brass Birmingham. Brass Lancashire is basically the same as the old Brass with a brand new coat of awesome looking paint. And then Brass Birmingham is a, really, it's a new game. So it uses all the same mechanics and everything, but there's a lot of differences. So I've had a chance to play both of the new editions, and I hope to try to play Birmingham again here, again in a couple of days. Uh, I really, really liked my first play of Birmingham. I think I prefer that one. It's definitely more complex to, I would say a significant degree, but not a large degree, if that makes sense. It's definitely more complex than Lancashire, and I think I could teach Lancashire you know, easier to whoever. Uh, and Birmingham's a little bit tricky because there's just a couple of extra kind of little mechanics sort of tacked on, but I really like uh, Birmingham. It just, it seems to be a little bit more replayable, uh, definitely a little bit more variable in the setup. And it's almost like, this isn't really the right term, but I'm gonna say it now and try to figure out the right term before the review. It has more paths to victory in a sort of different way. Uh, so there's just a lot more interactions that players can do with sort of the different markets and the industries and everything uh, that are available in that game. So I really, really am looking forward to reviewing that and playing it out more. And then the other game is Yellow and Yangtze, uh, which in both of these I frankly talked a little bit about in the last FM episode about Gen Con. Uh, Yellow and Yangtze, I've had a chance to play that again. And I played that a couple of times at Gen Con and really, really am enjoying it. Uh, I'm going to sort of let that one simmer, try to play that one another time and try to figure out if I like that better than Tigris and Euphrates because half of me that would kind of break my heart and I don't know why it's just the game but and the other half of me you know really kind of thinks it's better so we'll see we'll see so those are the kind of the two heavy hitter reviews uh, the other stuff that I'm looking at I'm staring at it right now is Western Legends from Colossal that just arrived today like I literally walked in the door and then was ready to do a podcast and this was sitting on the porch. So I'm really excited about that. That's from Colossal Games. It's uh, sort of a sandbox western if, you, if you've ever played the Red Dead Redemption video game, which is sort of like, this is a terrible analogy, but Grand Theft Auto in the Old West. Uh, very sandboxy, that kind of thing. This is 
sort of been pitched as Merchants and Marauders, if you ever played that old game. That was kind of a sandboxy pirate game where you could kind of travel around and be a pirate or be a merchant. And this one you can kind of be, uh, you know, the good cowboy or the evil cowboy, be a sheriff or whatever, get thrown in jail. So I'm really excited about this one. And a couple of folks that have had a chance to play this uh, prior and and put up some of their thoughts on the internet, it has, it's been positive. So I'm really excited to try this, and I've been very, very excited about uh, uh, this game. And that's Western Legends. So that's kind of the upcoming stuff. Western Legends will be a little bit down the road. And if you haven't seen any of my more recent reviews the last couple of weeks, I think I've done five, maybe five or six reviews in the last few weeks. And definitely go check out the YouTube channel if you missed any of those. All that stuff I'm excited to uh, share with you and to varying degrees. Some stuff I like more than others, but all of the stuff I've been talking about I really have enjoyed. A uh, couple of two that have missed the mark. Let's get kind of the easy one out of the way. Uh, Games Workshop's been putting out, they put out three games that are Barnes & Noble exclusives, which kind of drives me a little bit crazy because if you look at the channel, I reviewed Blitz Bowl, which is kind of a, like a light blood bowl, and then Space Marine Adventures, which is sort of a light Space Hulk, but it's co-op, and it's really light. Uh, and I've actually only played it solitaire. It's a good solo game. Uh, but those are really good games, and I I feel bad because if people are looking for them and their Barnes & Nobles are sold out, and I think these games are both sold out at Barnes & Noble online, at barnesandnoble.com, uh, then it's hard for people to get. And so the uh, local store that I do most of my games workshop stuff at didn't even know about them. And so that's that's kind of disappointing because I, especially with Blitz Bowl, I really think that one could have some more legs beyond just sort of a big market, you know, uh, impulse purchase at a Barnes and Noble. So that kind of stinks, but those are good games. So definitely try to seek them out, I think. Uh, there's a third one, <laughs> which is not good at all. And that's a Lord of the Rings quest for Mount Doom. And I don't, this game is just not good. It's just not good at all. Uh, the, the premise, right, that I'm going to give you the premise, and that should probably make anybody run away screaming just from the premise is you have uh, all the different, you know, members of the fellowship and Lord of the Rings, but you're all competing with each other to try to find the ring and take it to Mount Doom, and then you're trying to sabotage the other people trying to take it to Mount Doom. For, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I could see it if there was a thing where once you got the ring, you became corrupted and you were trying to work with Sauron. Like, that's not what happened in the books, obviously, but that's sort of within the realm of possibility. Um, and the other problem with the game is it's roll and move. So you're just rolling and moving. You have choices where you can go, but you roll a move and move around and you play these like take that event attack cards on other players and a lot of times it'll like reset that player to a large degree back to you know the beginning almost and you just kind of you just kind of roll the dice and move around and see what happens and play cards and it's just not not good it's not good at all <laughs> and the board is super ugly it's just a bunch of boxes with lines on them and stuff yeah so i don't know what kind of the thought process was there i think because they're doing these games in the barnes and noble exclusive they want it to be like a family game again like an impulse purchase hey we like lord of the rings in this family we'll buy this it's a simple easy roll and move game and we can play you know attack cards each other and have a laugh and all that that's i mean sure okay that's probably okay but i just don't think it's good at all um so that's, anyway, that's Lord of the Rings Quest for Mount Doom. So the other game is a game that's been getting a ton of praise. And uh, I sort of, I would say 30% like the game. And that's Detective, uh, a modern crime story. That's from Portal Games. And I've played it twice. I played through the first case uh, with the group, the game group. And then I it didn't, it really fell flat with everybody at the table. And then I was like, okay, well, everybody's really liking it. So then I came back, and then a few days later, I played it uh, solo. I played the second case. So there's five cases in the book, and you kind of play through it like a Sherlock Holmes consulting detective where you're reading sort of stories and even going online and Googling things and, and going on to this uh, electronic database that's a website that Portal has put up that supplements all of the case files. And so you're doing all that kind of stuff. And then you kind of you kind of work through the cases, and, it, and I expect I stopped after number two, but I expect it gets more involved in things as you go along. 
Uh, so it's a lot of like reading paragraphs and discerning the clues and trying to figure out what's going on. And it's hard to turn to talk about this without spoiling it. Now, the, I'm going to just say one kind of spoiler sentence, but it's literally like in the first opening paragraph of the first case. And so it has you sort of researching the history of this pocket watch that has come under into the wrong person's hands. It was effectively stolen in the past and sort of yada, yada, yada. I don't want to spoil too much. But you're trying to retrace the steps of this pocket watch. And through the process of that, you sort of learn some of these more seedy details. You go back in history, and there is some interesting stuff that you sort of interact with through the path of tracing the pocket watch. And that part's neat. I like that. I also like the overall mechanics of the game because certain actions that you do take up a certain amount of time and you have like three or four days, let's say, worth of time and each action will take up some hours. And then you can work past 5 p.m., work into overtime, which will sort of like reduce your score at the end. And the way that you kind of manage which kind of leads and clues and all that, like that whole system, I really, really did like that. Um, and I kind of liked how all of these ancillary things would sort of latch on to the main case. But in the case of the first, ca in the case of the first case, looking for the history of the pocket watch was very underwhelming, because the concept is you're part of this new federal task force unit to you know, uh, investigate these big crimes or these, you know, your, your special unit. And then they are like, oh, well, if you're all rookies or whatever, for your first case, you're going to research this pocket watch. That premise right there is super boring. I, I want to see like uh, a politician murdered or somebody, somebody's kidnapped or something like very dramatic, something that I would be like, oh, wow, we better solve this or something bad's going to happen. Not like, oh, the history of the pocket watch. That was super boring to start with. And then on top of that, a lot of times you're reading, it's not like you're reading red herrings, but you're reading a lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the case. It will just, you know, it just gives you like this, all this extra detail. And when you're reading it, you're thinking, okay, am I missing any detail in this? Is there some clue here? But no, it's about Betty who works at the desk at the laboratory. And it's like, okay, well, that's a character that you're going to kind of get to know maybe later or something. But it just, it, it doesn't really keep you engaged with where the story is moving and there's too much like different stuff that people can be reading so one person can be googling the history of something because the case will tell you like what to do and say oh we go look up this event from history another person will be online looking at the online database at the portal website reading that stuff and it kind of separates you all into these different areas and then you come back and read it and then it's like, well, let me read that, you know, and then otherwise you got like eight, all five people narrating different things. And then one person like reading the cards that flip over. So it just kind of it, all of that kind of separation of the narrative it kind of scattered across all these different things. It seems like it kind of breaks it up, too. And yeah, just the case itself wasn't engaged. Like I said, the system's cool. And I kind of like the concept and how everything worked. I like the online database. Like you could get fingerprints and then you would type in a code and then that would help you like unlock things. That was really cool. So the whole system is really neat, but I didn't care. Like I didn't care about anything that was going on. I wanted there to be some drama. Like I wanted to be like in a law and order episode or something, or in this case, it's more of like a, a federal, almost global task force. So maybe there would be more like of a James Bond vibe or, you know, something a little bit more R rated or something, um, you know, something to like make me, feel emotionally attached to what's happening but because the narrative is kind of scattered and it's just about a pocket watch and then the second story is about like a cold case related to the first case that's not really a spoiler but so it's all this like cold case stuff and it's like that this is not something that they would give a special task force you know the ability to do and it's just i don't know it just it seemed like it was good and it worked but it just it didn't engage me in a way that i wanted to care about it and keep going so anyway, that is a detective uh, modern crime story. Uh, and hopefully I would be certainly open to like uh, expansions that had some of those elements that I talked about uh, and be more in tune. And the, maybe the writing or something was a little bit more interesting and dramatic and, and, uh, and a little bit tighter on that side of it. But the system and everything worked pretty well. Okay, so that's uh, kind of summing up some of the reviews and things that are coming. And uh, let's take a quick little break here, and then we'll go through the top 10 things I've learned uh, from painting miniatures.
Okie dokie. So we're back. And uh, before we get into the top 10, I just wanted to make a couple of quick mentions. One is that if you if you get into this and you know you're, you get interested, then you go on, you start watching videos of, of people that are painting and stuff. I would say just be careful of watching people that are really good uh, because especially if you're just starting out, they are a thousand percent going to be way better than anything that you do. That's just how it's going to be. And I just say, don't beat yourself up about it. Look at the miniature in terms of, okay, it was unpainted in gray plastic and now look at what you did and now it's yours. And so just, I would say, just be okay with that and be into that and look at the work that you put into it and you know, this, the amount of time that you spent with it and just be happy with it. And you, if you really get into it, you're going to get better. That's just going to happen. But I say just be really careful about you know watching pros and be like, oh, it doesn't look like that. I don't have all these different layers of shades and highlights and everything. The other thing is I just wanted to mention quickly about assembling miniatures. Now, most board games you get, you don't have to do any assembly. Some you do. If you get like a Games Workshop boarding, board game, you'll have to do assembly. And if you get into a miniature game, obviously you're most likely have to do assembly. Um, I've learned to enjoy this. This is... Uh, much less fun for me than actually painting the completed miniature. But I've learned to kind of just do this whenever, like when I'm watching TV or, you know, like my wife and I, we don't have a show that we're watching and we're just gonna turn on the news or whatever, or we watch Safari on YouTube and, uh, you know, stuff like that. We'll just kind of leave it on in the background. That's something I can do. I can just kind of stop it whenever, if there's something comes up or we're gonna go do something or run to the store, I can just put it down and whatever and get back to it. So. It's also become sort of a meditative thing, which the painting itself has too, but that's something I've kind of learned to just deal with and just, you know, just kind of learn to enjoy. I actually do enjoy it now, but it took some time and I've got a little bit into like converting miniatures where you take bits from other parts that aren't necessarily meant to go with that miniature and then, you know, saw stuff off and attach it and use uh, green stuff and mash my own little uh, sculpture things on there, like put some spikes on something. So I've kind of learned to get into that. Um, but I would say, don't let that really intimidate you. Just that's all I can say. If, if you're like, I really want to do this, but I don't want to put any miniatures together and have to clip them out and glue them and everything. Uh, so just, just don't be in a hurry <laughs> because it's just, it takes, it's not really like hard. It's just sometimes miniatures are, are hard to put together if they're like really spindly or lots of pieces. But I say just don't rush yourself. And to me, it's the least enjoyable part of the whole like kind of hobby process. But I have learned to kind of pretty much enjoy it. So anyway, that's kind of the only real caveats. I will also mention some resources that I'll put links to in the podcast and the video description uh, for getting started in painting and stuff like that. Um, but let's go into kind of the top 10. These aren't really like the top 10 things about painting. These are kind of the top 10 things I learned and I was like, oh yeah, I never really thought about that before I started painting. I didn't think that would be a real thing. And I don't know how these are ordered. I just kind of did these in sort of reverse order. That's how I'm gonna explain them here uh, because they're kind of the things that I think had a from least to biggest impact in terms of like, oh wow, I didn't expect that, you know. Uh, but this this first one, number 10, is uh, it's interesting because I didn't really think about it. And I, I would say, number 10, painting does not have to be a lonely or lonesome endeavor. Now, a lot of people, they build up like a little desk, they have all their paints and they have like in like an office or a certain corner of the house or whatever. That's where they go and that's where they paint and they're alone. They turn music on or turn TV on in the background or whatever. But I've got it to the point where I have a couple of these like little plastic boxes, not very big. The paints go in there. I got a little case for some paints, a little tiny case from uh, Michaels for the brushes. And I just kind of have them stuffed in the little corner of uh, a shelf. And then when I want to paint, I take them all out. I got a little mat. I drop it down on the kitchen table, get some paper towels and set everything out. And then I'm able to be there in the same area as my family because the living room and the kitchen's like one big room sort of and that's where I'm at and so I'm not sequestering myself on hours on end away from everybody so it doesn't have to be a lonely thing and like I mentioned before like we'll put Safari on YouTube and Chromecast it to the TV and then that will just be on and I'll be able to still visit and you know hang out <laughs> and you know I can still paint 
and so that it doesn't have to be this lonely thing where you're just a little hermit off and alone and away from your family or away from your friends and doing things like that. So it doesn't have to be that way. And that's and that's very important for me because, you know, we you just you don't want to like have all of this sort of hobby time just taking you away from people that aren't necessarily involved in your hobby, which could be your family or your friends. So in this way that I'm able to still kind of do the hobby stuff, but not have it really impact at all, you know, family time in the evening. It doesn't, and my wife has even said to me, she says, I love that you're painting because when you come down in the kitchen, you're there, we can visit, we can chat, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't remove you. Like if we're, as opposed to like on Thursdays when I go to game night, that's a night I miss with the family. So, and that's fine, but it's just, that it doesn't have to be that with the painting. You can do it in a, such a way that, uh, you know, you don't have to remove yourself. So that was number 10, does not have to be lonesome. Uh, number nine, this is interesting, as I would say, if you get into painting and you paint a lot, you're gonna be, do a lot of sitting. And I know as gamers, especially board gamers, we do a lot of sitting. We sit around the table for a couple hours and that's it. And me, I have a desk job, I do computer programming, and I do a lot of sitting. And one of the things that I've noticed with painting is I can get sort of a sore back. If I get really into it and I sit there for six hours sometimes, my back's gonna be a little stiff. And the thing that helps out with that, and this goes in general, and I don't mean this to come across as preachy, but exercise. You gotta do some exercise throughout the week, two, three times a week. Go to a gym, go for walks, you know, go for jogs or whatever you gotta do. That's gonna balance this whole mental side uh, this mental exercise really that's that's what's happening and that's a really a lot of what gaming is is mental exercise because you like let's just think of it in terms of a war game or an economic game you're sort of going through the motions of practicing and simulating uh, a thing in the real world and really no matter what game you're playing you can be playing a large miniature game or a little abstract game and you're doing a mental exercise think of it like a crossword puzzle in the Sunday paper all of this is very very healthy mental exercise and painting is also a way of mental exercise there's creativity you're choosing the colors and all this kind of stuff which i'm going to talk about as we go through the list but that should i think be balanced with physical exercise and because again doing all of this mental exercise you're just sitting and that's not good sitting just sitting all the time is not good it's just not good so any kind of motion anything you can do like you don't have to go lift weights and and get on the elliptical machine and grind out and just be the perfect body and all that i'm not talking about anything related to that but just i think as a good balance to sitting is exercise and i've noticed that when i sit for a long period of time with painting because you're kind of hunched over you you know you got your brush on the little miniature you know you can kind of tense up your back but if you go for a walk or something like that and just get moving then that's going to help balance that out and that's going to allow you to paint even more so i just think that's uh, very important that's not something i really thought about as i started to get more into painting like oh well i really should keep doing uh this exercise and stuff so that's number nine exercise and i am certainly not the perfect exerciser uh, i work out two times a week and then usually well go for a walk also like basically every day and then uh, like a long walk on the weekend, usually, unless it's winter, <laughs> we, we kind of skip those long walks. But anyway, so I just try to keep active, just some kind of activity. Okay, that's number nine. Number eight, uh, so most of the time when you're painting your miniature, you've got to prime your miniature. You got to spray it with some primer, or paint it with some primer. Um, I know I live up here in North Idaho and it gets uh, really cold relatively in the winter. And so it makes it tricky to prime my miniatures because if it's really cold or really humid outside, then if you use a spray primer, which is the quickest and easiest way to prime your miniatures, it can damage your miniatures. Uh, especially a, the white colored primers seem to be the worst. Uh, the blacks I definitely will be more risky with, um, but the white one, it comes on like kind of chalky or dusty. And then when you go to apply the paint to it, it absorbs it like a sponge instead of like just sticking on the flat plastic. It like sucks into this like chalky primer. It looks awful. Now you can still, you know, you can still make it serviceable and playable and you know all that. But if you're trying to make it look really cool, then that's going to suck because it's just going to, it's going to be bad. Um, so I would say if you live in a cold or humid area where 
Uh, I mean, like, like, let's say you go outside and it's raining. Like, okay, well, I shouldn't prime today because it's raining and really humid out. Or if you live like in Florida and it's really humid, you're like, oh, if I wait a day or two, it'll be fine. Then I can prime the minis. But like here in the winter, basically, I shouldn't be priming from like late October into May. You know, here, this is the way the weather is here. Which stinks because it's like, well, do I just prime a bunch of minis in the summertime and then work through them on painting? But then you have like this huge backlog of miniatures. Like, I'll have to get through all of these. It just kind of stinks. Um, and I actually got an airbrush, a uh, relatively cheap airbrush, it was like 80 bucks, and uh, use uh, airbrush primer, because you can get paint that's just like paint or it's like a primer paint, and then I use the airbrush to prime. And the thing is, is that actually works, because what happens is the, it's actually the propellant in the cans that is the problem. So actually shooting the paint out uh, through the airbrush, you don't really run into that same issue. And frankly, priming with an airbrush is actually the best anyway. So even if it's like summer, it's better to prime with the airbrush because it just gives a little bit more control out of how much paint's coming out of it and all that stuff. So I'd say if you really get into it, if you really get into painting, I would invest in an airbrush. Uh, you get a cheap airbrush, a cheap compressor, and this use it to prime your miniatures. And one thing that it does is it makes it really easy to do what's called zenithal priming. And what zenithal priming very simply is you spray it all black, the whole miniature, all the nooks and crannies, and then you load it with white, and then you spray white from a, a top, like so directly above the miniature's head. So you just kind of sort of dust it sort of with white from the top, and then you kind of rotate it down in sort of like a 45 degree angle from the top of the miniature. You do that, so that kind of like pre-shades it, so it's kind of lighter on the top and darker on the bottom. And then if you apply like, let's say red to like an arm that's sort of like bending, so it's gonna be lighter red on the top and then darker red at the bottom. So it's like automatically like pre-shading for you. And that just makes it makes it cool. This makes it look that much more interesting. So anyway, I would just say, uh, that's one thing I never really thought about was the whole priming process and when to prime and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can certainly do like a paint on primer uh, where you just use a brush and do that. And that's, I've done that before as well. Um, so yeah, so just something to be considered about. And if you really get into it, I wouldn't necessarily do it right away. Think about, you know, investing and saving up some money for an airbrush just to do, like I said, that Zenithal priming, and then it allows you to kind of prime, uh, pretty much any time of the year. Uh, number seven is really just about the online, uh, painting community. And this goes for various Facebook groups, various websites, uh, all over YouTube, just how helpful and positive that community uh, really is. It's definitely, as far as like all the gaming communities I've been involved with over the last several years, the painting community is the best, absolutely the best, because the people are just there to help each other and to share each other and share their techniques and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so I think a part of the reason for bringing this up is because painting can be very an intimidating, uh, deep process to really dive into but just know that the online community is there for you. There's tons and tons of YouTube videos of how to do everything from very simply, like, like I talked about just a second ago, priming to doing base colors to simple shading techniques. That's all very, um, you know, attainable. You don't need to be a master artist to make stuff look halfway cool to put on the table. You don't need to. Like the intimidation doesn't need to be there. And unless you're a perfectionist right away, then, you know, be intimidated. But as long as you're, you, you can break away from the perfectionism, then you can certainly get into a spot where I think you're gonna be very happy with how things turn out for you. And there's just a lot of great YouTube videos, great Facebook groups dedicated to like specific games or just different like local um, painting communities. That's something that we've had here. So it's just cool to just kind of show stuff that you've worked on, see what other people have worked on. And then you kind of start to sort of toolbox all of these different techniques and things that you see because you're like, okay, first I'm priming the miniature, put some basic colors in there, kind of paint by numbers, you know, paint the arm red, paint the legs, the pants blue, the face of the skin color, you know, and then you start to experiment with that. You start to change colors and mix colors and try different shading techniques and highlighting techniques. And you just kind of slowly evolve your toolbox to use different things in different situations. And so the online community these days, I mean, if you went back 10 years, I don't think it would be so readily available and just the different formats these tutorials and in, in these forums are in. So you can watch videos, you can see step-by-step -step text tutorials and whatever's kind of easiest for you to learn. 
that information is now just going to be out there and there's going to be multiple versions and multiple ways to do different things. So really the online painting and it's most and it's mostly like 99% positive people just sharing stuff, you know, share stuff and ask for feedback and say, "Hey, what would you do differently here? What what's a technique cuz you're not going to know what to even ask a lot of times like, "What would I do to make this do that?" And they'll be like, "Well, if you could try this, this and this and then you can try one of them." So the information is just going to be there. And then number six, kind of dovetailing off the online community, is I would highly recommend there's a Reaper Bones Learn to Paint kit. And I'll put a link definitely to my video reviewing that. Uh, they have a couple of different kits out. I would highly recommend it to do that. So you get this kit, you get like three miniatures in it, you get a bunch of paints, you get some brushes, you get some step-by-step -step tutorials that you can kind of read through and paint through, like step-by-step, like first you're gonna paint the bone, then you do this, okay, then they do the shade, you decide to make a wash, da da da. And then by the end of that, you're gonna have three completed miniatures that are not part of any game that you're afraid of ruining. Cause you know, that's one of the things is like, hey, I just got blood rage, I'm gonna learn to paint. And you're like, well, I don't wanna ruin these figures. So this is cool because it, I think it's about 30 bucks. So you get that, you get a bunch of paints and stuff that you can continue to use. And then you can just step into that process and don't be afraid. And then I think you'll find, this is what I found as I went through it and I was like, huh, I could do this. This is okay. I mean, this stuff doesn't look like it's gonna win a, a crystal brush award by any means, but I'm able to knock it out and I'm like, I'm, I'm happy with this. This is gonna be cool. I can uh, play a game with miniatures now that are painted and it's gonna be neat. It's just gonna be that much more fun. Uh, so I would highly recommend that Learn to Paint kit. And like I said, I'll have a link to uh, my, my review of that kit from a couple of years ago. And uh, def you just gotta, gotta get into that. So that's number, that was number six. And number five here, um, I would say this is not necessary when you start, but the sooner that you jump into this, the better it's gonna be. And this is what's called a wet palette. And I'll put a link to a video that talks about exactly kind of in detail what a wet palette is. But basically what that is, it can be as simple as like a little Tupperware box with um, some wet paper towel and then some parchment paper you get for like baking or cooking. You can just go buy at the grocery store and you just put that on top and then you can close it up with the lid for the Tupperware and stick it in the fridge. And then it'll just sit there for like weeks and uh, and it's, it's cool because you're like, okay, what's the big deal? I can just get like a little paper plate or something and just mix my paint on there, drop paint on there and then move it to the miniature. This is cool because like, if you try to like mix a color and you're like, oh, it's ex I'm trying to mix it again like two days later and it's not the, quite the exact shade, then you know, you're like, oh, screw, I screwed it up. I got to paint over it again and change the color. If you leave it on this wet palette, then it'll stay. And then you can just see exact, just like it'll stay wet. And the other benefit is like when you're, even while you're sitting there painting, if you've been sitting there for hours, it will still be wet. And so if you don't use it, then the paint's gonna dry up within minutes. And you're like, oh, I, dry, I dried it up, so now I've gotta use more. So you actually are like wasting paint as well using a dry palette because you'll sit there and then, you know, the phone will ring, let's say, and you go answer it or get a drink of coffee or something. And you come back and the paint that you would put on there is now dry, so you gotta use more paint. So definitely get a wet palette. And like I said, I'll have a link to a video uh, just about how to make your own wet palette. I have this one called Stay Wet. I'll, I'll put a link to that palette as well. I got it at uh, Michael's. I think it was, I might have got it on sale, but I think it was 12 bucks when I bought it. And it comes with some sponges and stuff. And I got parchment paper. And uh, I got like a huge pack of it. It's like 100 pieces. Let me see. Yeah, I was just looking. It's like 100 pieces. And it fits, this particular parchment paper fits it perfectly. And like, I've got the wet palette sitting in the fridge right now. I just leave it in there. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's just great. Like you think, okay, it's just a palette, like no big deal. I say, if you're just starting and experimenting, you know, forget it, whatever. But once you feel like I want to do this and I'm going to paint this whole game, like I'm going to, oh, okay, I'm, I'm into it. I want to paint blood rage, get yourself a wet palette, go for it. In addition to the paints and brushes that you want. Um, Cause it's, it'll just save you time and just a lot of heartache and a little bit of frustration. Got to get yourself a wet palette. That's number five. And then kind of dovetailing from that, again, if you're just starting, you do not need, in my opinion, any fancy, quote unquote, fancy miniature paints. You don't need Games Workshop paints, you don't need Vallejo, you don't need P3 paints or Reaper paints or any of that stuff. You can go to the 
hobby store, like a Michaels or a Hobby Lobby or something like that, whatever's in your area, you can get these paints. They're called folk art paints. And they're giant bottles compared to like a miniature bottle. They're like four or five times as much paint. And they're a buck each. They're super cheap. Then, you know, because some of these miniature paints, yeah, they're better. They are 100% better for painting on miniatures. And they're going to cost you like four bucks for like a quarter of the paint that you get for a buck in a folk art bottle. And so the paint's going to come out a little bit thicker, but just water it down with more water and it will work just fine. I still use them like when I'm painting terrain or something just to do that, just because it's, you know, I'm going to go through a lot more paint. So I'll use them on terrain. And, but I would still use them on like a regular miniature. They're perfectly fine. They are perfectly fine. You know, it, uh, the, I like the folk art ones because the metallics that they have are just, they have ones. <laughs> There's some of the other ones that are like similar sort of $1 for a big bottle brands like folk art, but like Americana is one that I've seen people use. But the folk art ones, this they have like the golds and the silvers. So you're painting like swords or like necklaces or something. Then it's just easy to do that. But you, like I said, you're not going to win a crystal brush using folk art paints, but you're going to get in and get your feet wet. And you're not going to have to spend like a hundred bucks on like a giant case of Vallejo paint or something. You can go to the store and spend like, I don't know, 10 bucks on different things. And if you're comfortable mis mixing colors, then you can do that. Or you can spend a little bit more money and get a lot a variety of more kind of out of the bottle colors and you're going to be good to go. And I certainly would not shy away from just picking up some relatively cheap brushes, some folk art paints, and just getting going. And that's in lieu of buying that Reaper uh, Learn to Paint kit. I would I would do that 100% over jumping into folk art stuff, but still do it. Like I painted my entire Warhammer Quest um, Silver Tower box set with folk art paints. That's all I used. <laughs> and it, were, it looks fine. I mean, it's been, it doesn't look as good as the stuff I've done now, but I don't look at it and go, oh, I hate that. I don't hate it at all. It looks fine. I would totally play with it. Um, so yeah, if you get like a board game or something and you're like, I want to paint it, but I don't want to spend 80 bucks or 100 bucks on brushes and miniature paints and all that, go for the folk art stuff. You know, who cares? Just go for it. It looks just fine. It will look perfectly fine and look way better than gray plastic. A thousand percent. Just gotta make sure you thin it down. Just thin it down a little bit more. Just add a little bit more water so it's not like, you know, globbing onto the miniature. That's it. So moving on to number three is, so the sense of accomplishment when you complete, uh, let's say you're, you're painting a game and you complete it, it feels really good when you finish it. But you can also be in a position where you're kind of overwhelmed. And I keep going back to Blood Rage because I'm staring at it. Uh, which I haven't painted because I've just don't, I have a lot of other things to paint. I, one day I'll paint it, I'm sure. But the thing is in Blood Rage, there's a lot of miniatures because you have all the little Viking guys and there's like 25 of those for each faction. And then you've got all the different monsters. So it's just a lot of miniatures. I think it's just like, I don't know how many miniatures are in that, like 60 or 80 or something, a lot. Especially if you got like all the Kickstarter extras and stuff. Um, or if you had like Battle Lore, there's a bunch of little guys to paint and stuff like that. Um, so that initial task of I'm going to paint all the miniatures in this board game can be overwhelming. So I would say, and it will get you to the point where you're like, oh, I mean, I'm not even going to do it. I'm not even going to try painting because it's just so much stuff. I'll just never, it'll take me months. Yes, it will. <laughs> yes, it will. But do this. Set like incremental goals for yourself to finish. So let's say you were painting, let's say you're, you wanted to get in a Warhammer 40,000 or Age of Sigmar. You're like, I want to paint a big 2,000 point army, which is like 60 minis or more, and I'm going to do that, or I'm going to paint Blood Rage or whatever. Set yourself a small goal. Say, I'm going to paint this five troop unit and paint all five of those and just get those done. Or in Blood Rage, I'm going to paint one of the player factions and just kind of knock those out. And then you'll be done with that. And you can just, you can take a break then. You can take a week or two off and then get back to the next one. Just set small kind of inter incremental goals. And so those will kind of snowball. And then meanwhile, as you're doing those small goals, you're gonna get better and quicker and faster and just learn to, you know, which parts to focus on and all that kind of good stuff. And so this is kind of spiral into the point where like, oh, now I'm done with the game. Yeah, it's four or five months later or more, 
but now I'm done and you've got that sort of notch on your belt and when you're ready you can move on to the next thing. Now you can also uh, take on uh, games that don't have as many miniatures like let's say you had Fury of Dracula that has like six miniatures or something or you can get into the Warhammer Underworlds game like Shadespire or there's a new one coming out called Night Vault in a month and those you, there's like five six seven eight miniatures depending on which box you get but that's not a ton right you can just do that few uh, a game with that few miniatures or like if you're painting Descent you could just say I'm gonna paint all the heroes first and then maybe I take on, after that I get done, that done, I could do one group of monsters. Instead of trying to do the whole thing, then you can just, you know, do it in bite-sized chunks. And I think that, again, will just kind of build on itself and spiral and snowball. And eventually you're going to be done. Because you're not, as long as you don't focus on the huge monumental task ahead of you and just the small task and then... Once you know that, don't, again, stay away from the, the monumental task and focus on the next small task. And then by the time you are done, you're going to be like, oh, oh, look, I'm done. <laughs> so that's, I think that's important. And that's helped me as well. Because uh, I kind of bounce back and forth between board games and then Warhammer Age of Sigmar and stuff. And, you know, I just do little bits here and there. And I'm like, oh, look, that army's done. Great. And speaking of which, moving into number two is... Having painted models, 100% to me, makes the game enjoy it, more enjoyable. And I, before I started painting, that really wasn't the case. Like, I did not care if they were painted. I would look at them, and in my mind's eye, I was uh, imbuing them with the colors. You know, with my imagination was just was filling in the blanks. And I, I perfectly fine. Like, if you're listening to this and you get through this, I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to paint. I am cool. Like I have no judgment left or right on somebody that would have that attitude. It doesn't bother me. If we sit, if I sat down and played a game with you, for example, if you were like that and you said, "Oh, I got this," and none of the minis are painted, I'd be like, "Yeah, it's no big deal." <laughs> um, but for myself, since I've started painting them, I now, in the back of my head, it's not really in the forefront, but in the back of my head, I'm like, "Yeah, it would be much cooler if these were painted." Like I would just like it better. It doesn't cause me any heartburn if they're not but now that I've kind of got the bug and it's bit me and I've been painting I want to paint the miniatures I it makes it, I want to see it because it's just once that that's done and once it does happen I know how much more fun and enjoyable it is and it's it's, it's a strange thing it's kind of, kind of like you don't know until you know type of thing and that's that's really what's happened to me is I would just like oh it's got many cool I can paint those and that'll just be really cool and that's because we're going to get to the number one now. And this number two is kind of related to number one. And number one is the process of painting is actually or can be an integral part of the actual gameplay and the actual narrative uh, that the, you know, the gameplay kind of sits in. Like it's, it's really a, a significant part of it. To me, at this point, it's not a separate thing. It's not like, okay, there's mechanics and then there's theme and then there's painting you know, whatever, it doesn't, it, they kind of bleed together now at this point for me, because the process of painting, it's, you start the storytelling, you start, okay, uh, Susie has a pink cape, and uh, Billy Bob there, he wears all black, or whatever, so you start to endow these characters, and their sort of costume choices, their fashion choices, you know, that gives them some personality, and those are the choices that you're making for them, and, you know, like in terms of like a miniature game with the Warhammer or something, you're giving them certain weapons or whatever. You're building your army in a certain way. So the whole construction and the painting process starts to, you start to build your narrative and build, you're doing a little bit of world building as well uh, in that process. And that just by investing that time and that effort and just that amount of creativity and sort of uh, the focus on these kind of little details narrative starts to kind of emerge out of it is by the time you get to playing the game with the painted miniatures you've got some backstory you can be thinking about some of this stuff while you're painting it's like like i can think of it right now because i'm looking at them i have an iron jaws army for uh for warhammer age of sigmar and a lot of times you see the the orcs or oryx whatever are painted like really bright colors like orange and yellow and red because it's there was like the the tribe of the sun and all this stuff or like the red blood 
you know, Oryx and stuff. And I painted them in like black armor because it, I think it looks really cool. And it kind of reminds me of the, uh, gosh, it was it's not the Badlands. There was like a zone in World of Warcraft where the Oryx had black armor. And it was like, in a, you went through this giant gate and it was like a blasted realm and they had the black armor and stuff and they were kind of like mercenaries and stuff. And so the Iron Jaws faction always felt like a very much a mercenary destruction clan where they were sort of like the big hitters of the destruction gods and they went on special missions and all that. So like all of that kind of stuff was like going through my head just because I chose black armor for them, uh, you know? <laughs> and so it's also based on in the old Warhammer fantasy of the black orc. And that was like a special, like elite orc that at least in Warhammer Online it was. I don't really know that much about the actual tabletop fantasy. Anyway, so, but anyway, all of this stuff, these thought processes are going through my head as I'm saying, which color do I want to make them? And I'm like, huh, I'd be, they would look kind of cool in black. And then, so you kind of go through da, 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 this and that. And so just that kind of stuff, and you're like, you know, this guy's got this scepter that glows. What color do I want to paint the scepter, the flame coming out of it? I'm like, I'm going to paint it purple, <laughs> you know, because... It's like, it's it's a magical energy. It's not like a fire, like a red or a yellow fire. It's, it's like a, a bluish purple sort of arcane energy. So it's, he's more of a magical uh, arcane type of, of, of creature and less of a fire, you know, mage or something. So all those kind of things sort of go into it. You're painting the fur a, a, a certain color. You're painting the ghosts a certain way. Are they, is it like a very dirty looking ghost or a very clean sort of see-through ghost? that kind of stuff. So all of that kind of stuff um, informs that narrative, like the skin color that you use. You know, you, you can use a, like a lot of diverse skin colors. You're going to use a certain, you're going to paint them all like uh, very dark skinned or very light skinned or do they come from a certain realm? I can think of these um, ogres that I painted and I have these, um, not to get too much into the specific game, but one of them, they're like, there's frost ogres and they're from the cold. And then you can ally them with sort of a generic ogre, but I painted all of those generic ogres like a real icy looking blue. And so now when they ally, they look like they should be allied together because they're like sort of like ice ogres and stuff. Um, so all that kind of stuff just adds to the game and it just makes it more fun and just gives you little narrative things that you can just pick apart and, and sort of tack on. So yeah, so all of those, again, those top 10 kind of things uh, are just things that I didn't really expect and didn't think about until I started painting. I was like, oh yeah, they look cool. They're just cool painted miniatures and it definitely looks better than gray plastic, but why would I paint the miniatures? You know, that kind of attitude. But all of these things that I've been talking about, you know, imbuing them with character, you know, the investment and the ownership of it, the sense of accomplishment when you're done, you know, how easy it is actually to get involved. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money. There's a lot of YouTube tutorials and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be a lonesome thing. You know, I can do it in the kitchen. All that kind of fun stuff, that's just stuff that I didn't think about at all. And so I just wanted to share that with you. So in case you are somebody that's painting and maybe you've got some of your own sort of things. So, you know, I never realized that this would happen before I started getting into painting and, and definitely share that in the comments and stuff because uh, I think other people would want to read that. And if you're not into the miniature painting, maybe you've turned this off <laughs> a while ago. Uh, but, you know, if you're still listening, then, you know, just know that there's an unexpected kind of rewards. Uh, at least they were unexpected to me uh, at the end of the day. But that's uh, pretty much it for this podcast. Uh, definitely look for more of the standard reviews uh, over the next little while. Uh, you know, I kind of was taking a, somewhat of a hiatus there, doing more podcasting than reviews. But, you know, with Gen Con, a lot of new good games coming out. Uh, Essen's not that far away. So I'll probably tack into some more reviews. You know, I wouldn't say a whole lot more, but, you know, a, a fair pace of it going into the end of the year. And then we'll kind of see how things are going. Um, definitely going to try to do some more battle reports. I did two Age of Sigmar battle reports. I've been having fun with those. Now I want to, like wire up this whole room and <laughs> like had like four cameras and mics everywhere and you know spend eight hours on them but i don't have time <laughs> but anyway that's uh that's a, another thing to look out for on the on the channel and definitely leave any feedback and all that stuff and again i'm being more active on instagram and i'll have links to the instagram and the other social media stuff i'm on in the description but anyway i'll be on instagram more instagram seems like it's more fun <laughs> so i'm gonna be there 
Uh, anyway, have a good uh, September, and uh, we'll talk at you later. Thank you. Bye.